Welcome to the Arsenal Vision post-match podcast. Stan Kroenke's checkbook lets out an audible whimper as Mesut Ozil volleys Arsenal to victory. This is the Arsenal Vision post-match podcast. My name is Elliot Smith, and you can block me on Twitter, Yankee Gunner. That's right, Mesut Ozil spectacularly volleys home the winner. And, uh, you know, Arsenal's Twitter feed, I don't know if you noticed, kind of spending a lot of time talking about Mesut Ozil. And let me just check my calendar here. December 18th, seven days till Christmas. I wonder, I wonder if this could all be building to something. You know, we can speculate on that and more with our guests, our guests, our guests, our regular panel, our people we love, our family, if you will. That means Clive's not here, obviously. Tim is here. You can find him on Twitter at Stilberto. Hello, Tim. Hello. Paul is here. He's back. He's talking Arsenal with us. We are so pleased to have him. You can find him on Twitter at Pause My Pants. Hello, Pause. Hello. Clive graciously opted out because he felt that he wanted to give these two gentlemen some microphone time because we've been getting a lot of feedback that the only person anyone's listening for anymore is Clive, and and we have to pull back from that. Uh, Scott will not be here because I don't have time to record his segment. We'll do a longer Scott segment uh, coming up probably after the Carabao Cup because no one's going to want to discuss that match. In any event, let's get right on to it. And Tim? Mm. um, What? What's the formation? Because <laughs> I'm, I'm not totally sure. Are we playing a diamond in midfield? No. I mean, is Arson moving Ozil back because someone has to start linking the play? We can't just have all the midfielders running away from the back four when they get the ball. I mean, more than the lineup itself, which didn't surprise me hugely, um, other than the fact that Jack Wilshire started after playing 90 minutes in midweek. Mm. We can get, come on to that, but... What what is this formation? What what exactly are we doing? <laughs> it's it's really weird. It's it's a bit like a lopsided diamond. It's almost like a rhombus. I, I hang on, <laughs> hang on. Go, go, Google's rhombus. Oh yeah, okay, I see it. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I like I. So my interpretation of the dropping as uh, so a bit deeper is maybe to stop someone else from dropping a bit deeper. Um, and maybe dropping the one player that someone else actually trusts. Um, that That's partially, I think, my interpretation of it. It's help for Shaka, quite... isn't it? I mean, <laughs> God knows. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, when you look at the numbers in terms of the amount of times Ozil picks the ball up off the back four compared to Wilshire, that's really interesting. And I wonder if that's, um, you know, about kind of sharing the load with Wilshire as well. But... Yeah, I, I was actually really surprised by the lineup. I was really surprised that he persevered with um, with largely the team from West Ham. Wasn't surprised whatsoever about Lacazette coming in. But was the it rest Maitland of it, Niles more than anything, or what? What, what changes do you were you I, expecting? I, I was expecting that to change, although I wasn't. I wasn't desperate to see it change. Um, I think maybe the manager just kind of thought to give Maitland Niles these two games at left back. He probably just thought, well. You know, West Ham and Newcastle aren't exactly going to be pummeling our left-hand side with attacking wingers. So it, it's a fairly good time to introduce him. And, you know, we're down to a back four now. So that's one less player from the back um, from from whom to play out from. And if you put a passing midfielder in there like Maitland-Niles, I suppose that makes some sense. Um, but I was just surprised because I didn't really get a sense that Wilshire, Xhaka and Ozil together quite works and and i was quite surprised to see a wobi um stay in as well i it, it's it's and, and to me that's just because arsenal really look like they lack a creative spark at the moment and basically what i think wenger's trying to do is cram in as many passing midfielders as he possibly can um and again hope that that satisfies someone so that someone doesn't keep dropping back to the halfway line. I mean, I mean, you could um, just say Alexis, like we're all here. We all know who you're talking about. <laughs> it's but, but it's then, almost like they've put up like a cordon with big flashing lights, like on the edge of the center circle. You, you know, that bit in, um, in Forrest Gump where he's, he's playing American football and he's, he runs to the end line. And uh, they have to put up a massive t- sign to tell him to stop running. Stop running, yeah. <laughs> so he doesn't just run it out of the stadium. It almost feels like yeah. that with Alexis. Like, it gets... Are, are we a runner short, like, though, as a result of this? Like, yeah. I mean, is the Awobi sort of is the right, right wide forward nominally? Like, uh, is that... <laughs> I hate to say it, but, like, are we missing Theo, maybe? Or, you know, someone yeah, to get to yeah. the end line? I, I, I was going to say... I was honestly going to say that. Um, 
that's why I was a bit surprised to see Iwobi stay in. I, like As you know, I thought he played quite well on Wednesday night. A lot of people didn't share that opinion. But um, you're right. Like uh, Wenger did say quite explicitly after the West Ham game, you know, maybe we need someone to get up and support the strikers. Um, and again, maybe that was a pointed comment at someone. Um to, to kind of concentrate their efforts more on in the area. But when he talked about people running beyond the strikers and we haven't got Ramsey, I must admit in the build-up to this game, I did, I'm not saying I thought he'd play him, but I was thinking, is this Theo's way back in? You know, if, if we've got this situation where we've put all these passing midfielders into the team, but there's nobody, um, you know, to help Lacazette kind of make those runs, then is, is this like... Is this Theo's uh, potentially Theo's glorious return? Um, <laughs> no, I guess, I guess we'll see. I guess we'll see on Tuesday night if he sticks yeah. with this kind of formation and he says Theo is going to play. And if he plays well, then maybe he might be minded to do that against Liverpool, which which wouldn't massively surprise me. But oh, it would surprise yeah. me massively. I mean, if if his performance against Bate, and I acknowledge it was a, a terrible Bate, but if that performance yeah. wasn't enough to get him into a Premier League side again, you know again arguably two very beatable opponents you know in the back four setup it's just hard to see him having the trust in him to play against Liverpool I I suppose it depends how far you buy the argument that he was injured which is what Wenger's saying a little little bit of groin issue did he say something like that yeah it it doesn't sound terribly convincing to me small groin I, yeah. Look, I know that that can be a huge problem. It has plagued me most of my <laughs> adult life, and um, the best thing you can do is just soldier on. Chronic. Yeah. Chronic in your case. It is a chronic problem. Look, um, Paul, I, I think what's interesting to me here, though, with Ozil dropping deeper is Granite Chaka has dominated in in terms of the amount of passing he does in our team. Among all the midfielders, you know, the outfield players, um, he is – usually the one who leads us in passing, and, and he's averaging almost 20 passes a game more than Mesut Ozil. But in this game, where Mesut Ozil dropped deeper, he actually played 17 passes more than Shaka, 126 to 109. Now, that's still huge volume for Shaka, but, I mean... What were Jack's numbers? Uh, Jack you know? Wilshire, I do have them in front of me, in fact, and it looks as though Jack Wilshire played 80 passes. Um, so, I mean, you know, 46 behind Ozil. I mean, Ozil was clearly picking the ball up off the back four. He was linking the play. And while Shaka was still doing it as well, I mean, do you think that the manager moved Ozil into that position, in part, as as Tim's saying, to help Alexis stay pushed up the pitch a little bit more, which I think is working a little bit. We can come on to that. But do you think it's also in part because he's finally recognizing that Shaka can't do this all on his own. He can't be a one-man midfield. And there has to be a guy with ball security who can come collect the ball off the back four. And the one thing that Mesut Ozil has to his credit that I don't think he gets enough credit for, is incredible ball security. He is very hard to take off the ball. He doesn't get dispossessed a lot. He doesn't give the ball away a lot. Um, is this a move to get Shaka the help he has desperately needed pretty much all season? Yeah, I think so. The only thing that surprises me is that it was in this game when Jack's starting alongside him because, you know, theoretically, Jack's a kind of Santi equivalent. I know that... You know, half the people listening have just gone, oh, but he's not nearly as good as blah, blah, blah. I would say this, a one-footed Santi equivalent. And we can come on to the one-footed, two-footed thing in a bit because we're a very left-footed team right now. But, I I mean, I do think that that is a big difference because in Jack and Shaka, you have two of the most one-footed people players you'll see in a long time. You do. In in this game, though, Jack's one-footedness didn't prove to be an issue. I think when, when pressed much harder... You, you start to see some of the, the springs popping. but So my point being, really, arguably, Jack could have uh, shared the load in this game. And, and he has a reasonable number of passes. Um, so it just seems like the odd game for that to be the reason that Ozil was pulled back. Um, I, do th- I do like it from an Ozil development standpoint. Because um, I've always thought he had all the skills, but not the mentality to be... Well, he's got the skills to do almost anything, but certainly the skills to play in a three-man midfield. Uh, but that's never seemed to be the way he's wired because you got to be able to work both sides of it. But I mean, to me, where uh, I think Tim and I at different times have kind of expressed some skepticism about Ozil in terms of his long-term value to the team going forward. Uh, he seems to have got his head round 
what his job is within the team and not not a specific role but what being a, a team is what it takes to drive a team forward how to show leadership in recent times so it's kind of very very frustrating that it's at this point in time in his development with Arsenal he's become the man for all seasons I mean I absolutely yeah. love him to the point where I wouldn't recognize some of my feelings and statements about him some time ago um, he can do almost anything when he puts his mind to it and we're having him drop deeper uh, again I don't think against Newcastle this was necessarily the game that needed it and with Jack there but it is an interesting mix of the three of them. And I think the thing the two of you have missed in terms of formation is that it's quite clearly an inverted isosceles trapezoid. Can Just a trapezoid be here. isosceles? Oh, yeah. Really? Can it? Can it? The best ones are. Yeah, that's a good point. I didn't think about that. Um, all right. So putting geometry aside only momentarily, obviously. Yeah. Um, yeah, Tim, in the first half, we created a lot of chances. I mean, there were a lot of openings mm. here. The Lacazette played in Ozil. I don't remember when that was. Alexis had that little cute flick at the top of the box. Um, was it in Maitland-Niles or to Lacazette? Who was that to? Really early on, he, he got the ball and kind of back-flicked it in, put someone in behind. Um, kind of an acute uh, was angle. It not the was it not Was it? No, no, no. It was on the left side of the box. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, I, can't, I can't remember. Hey, exactly do you remember it. Ozil's double back heel tackle at one stage? Yes. Mm -hmm. That was great. What was that? Never well, seen that before. You know, you, you got to show off your skills with the ball and without the ball. I, look, I yeah. mean, I, there, there were chances here is the point, and there were, there were opportunities. Mm. And, you know, I think we're also frustrated because we're coming off two games where we, we failed to score, and there was a lot of sterile domination. But in this half, every, it felt like we were always right on the brink. You know, a shot yeah. would be blocked, or a player would get in and just didn't make the right move. Obviously, Lacazette had that terrible chip late in the game, but, you know, he was, he was in. Played him well by Iwobi, it should be said. Um, you know, Tim, I, I hate to go to things like confidence and stuff like that, but finishing is streaky. We know that. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes when teams are aware that they're not scoring goals, the pressure mounts and, you know, increased pressure can cause players to freeze up a little. And also, look, teams are scared of us right now is the best way I can put it. These, these teams aren't playing mm -hmm. us the way they were when we were vulnerable the last few seasons where they were pressing us in midfield, coming at us, taking the ball off us, and we were struggling to cope. We're getting 70% possession, three straight games in a row. We're battering teams, pushing them back. I mean, it, it, are we maybe seeing just, uh, uh, you know, we're banging on the wall. Is, is it possible that we're mm -hmm. closer to being where we need to be than maybe it seems because we're not getting the yeah. final ball right at the moment? Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. I thought in the first half we played some really nice stuff, actually. Um, I, was, I was really pleased with the first half. Um, and I think that's kind of gotten lost a bit because, I mean, how much do you want to slap yourself on the back for playing well against a pretty poor Newcastle side at home? Well, and also um, kind of riding out the storm for the last 30 doesn't help either. Ex you will come exactly. on that. But I mean, the problem exactly. is that's what people like, remember from the game and what they forget yeah, from the game yeah. is a period of almost an hour where we, we really had a nice, a lot of nice flowing moves, good dimension to our attack, and, yeah. and had them sitting in their own penalty area. Yeah, yeah, and of course the second half always colours people's opinions more than the first half, which is totally understandable. I also think um, the fact that a lot of the nice football in the first half came from Alexis um, kind of colours that as well, because we're in a bit of a period where people don't really want to give him any credit. Yeah, um, And he played, I thought he really got the mix of his game right in terms of the passes he was playing. A lot of them were coming off very cutting, very nice passes, um, again, in the last 30 yards of the pitch where um, they're much more effective. And, yeah, I think we're in a space where people want to pretend that's not happening. And for a selfish player um, who wants away from Arsenal, you know, um, it's interesting to see him putting his body, his head into a dangerous area, yeah. contesting with a much bigger guy to ultimately get the ball to come down. If I realize Ozil did all the work with his technique. Yeah, but the point yeah. is, you know, this claim of selfishness and not playing for the team and, and not wanting to be at Arsenal – that kind of hustle and energy, there are plenty of players who supposedly yeah. want to be at Arsenal who don't do that. And a couple yeah, of yeah. key blocks laid in the game yep. too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And again, like that that part of the goal has been kind of swept under the carpet because that's that's not how people want to talk about Alexis at the moment. The, the die is very much cast. Um, incidentally, I thought that goal was a wonderful illustration of the different qualities that Ozil and Alexis give you. Um, one of them tries to bash the door down by force and the other one 
um, likes to pick the lock. But yeah, yeah, and I, I think to row it back to your actual question, which was about the kind of the intangible, as it were, of confidence, I, I think that was quite clear to see in this game because I think what you saw happen was um, we played well in the first half, went one nil up, could have had one or two more, playing quite nice stuff. Little bit of an insipid start to the second half, nothing too alarming. But then when it got to about 25 minutes to go, you really sense this nervousness creep in. And it wasn't like Newcastle started coming out at us. It's, and this is something we have. So we saw this in the Huddersfield game, which we won 5-0. You get this lull and it almost it encourages the other team out at you. Um, only what we did in the Huddersfield game was we got that second goal. And who knows if Lacazette gets that chip right and that goes in. Maybe we're talking about another 4 or 5 nil here. But it, it didn't come. And that last 20 minutes, um, you know, we struggled to muster any sort of meaningful attack. And I think it was quite obvious at that point, having not gotten the second goal, that the confidence isn't quite there. And they were hanging on, really. They, ju- they just wanted to take the 1-0. And, and in many respects, that might. That's not just confidence. There's probably a physical element there. Certainly you know, for Jack, Will- Jack Wilshire, I think, noticeably tired. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah, he, he faded yeah. badly. Yeah. Which, which you can understand. And, um, you know, 10 of those players played on Wednesday night. A lot of them played on the Sunday at Southampton. You know, that's three, you know, pretty tough games in six days where we've had to go to the last minute um, because, you know, we've drawn the, the original two. So... You, you know, there's probably a physical element to it as well, where you kind of, uh, and how far the physical informs the psychological is anyone's guess. Um, I I'd, I'd guess that there's there's quite there's plenty of both going on in there. But yeah, I think you could see that they started okay and they started fairly sure of themselves. But once it was like they started to clock watch, you know, you know when it gets to about twenty to five on a Friday afternoon and your productivity just kind of goes out the window because you... Well, you well mine goes out clock. the window, you know, at 8 a.m. on Monday morning, but sure, go ahead. <laughs> but yeah, you know, you start eyeing the clock and you catch it and you realize there's 20 minutes left and you kind of go, oh, I'm just going to, you know, the, the work equivalent of running the ball to the corner flag, you know. <laughs> P- pretend to type um, an email for 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Tie your shoe. So it, I, I think there was a little bit of that going on as well, but I think it's quite clear we're not, you know, we're not, fluent at the moment um and how much that's informed by confidence is anyone's guess but i i think plenty of it probably is yeah yeah i think that's right and look i i have to just correct something really quickly because i gave you touch numbers instead of pass numbers before um so i just want to correct it mesut Ozil did not play 126 passes he had 126 touches but still the the point stands 107 passes to granite is 98 had more touches had more passes but to correct on jack wilshire he played 58 passes so i mean 50 fewer than Mesut Ozil, um, you know, substantially fewer. So, I mean, Ozil was really the the hub in the hub and spoke system, so to speak, and, and linking the play in this game. Um, Paul, we should talk Maitland-Niles. I mean, I was a little surprised to see him keep his place. Mm-hmm. I think Kolasinac, uh has deserved to be dropped. That maybe is too harsh a way to put it, but maybe needed some time away from the starting lineup. Maybe he, he's just struggling with you know the physicality, the pace, the the tempo of the league because i mean while he looks like a tank i mean that doesn't mean he can just play 90 minutes every single game uh, of a it, season and he, he it hit, takes a lot out of your engine to be dragging a tank around well the it field. does exactly i mean he's carrying a lot more lumber than the rest of them so i mean he he is um he has given way to to maitland niles and maitland niles played played both of these games and maybe the idea is he'll restore colisee natch in, in the liverpool match maybe he feels colisee natch is, is not a fullback but is purely a wingback or maybe he wants Maitland Niles to get some starts under his belt in the Premier League to get comfortable so that he can then maybe try him in central midfield, maybe give Granite Chaka a rest. So with all those possibilities in mind, my two questions for you really about uh Maitland Niles are first of all, what do you think of his performance? And second of all, do you think that fullback stroke wing back is a position he should and can continue to play in, or, or is his future elsewhere? So, uh, well, hopefully, as you remember, I've I've been kind of itching for Maitland Niles to get a You have a been really his champion on this podcast, and yes, you deserve yeah. all the credit in the world for that. <laughs> yeah, because I'm wrong on so, so, so many things. I, I need this right now, Elliot. I, I need you to back me on this. Paul, one. it's only going to so, take one bad performance for you to be wrong again. But you know that's how it works these I know. days. <laughs> we all know. We all know. 
Um, no, I thought I thought obviously he's been great the last two games. I mean that moment where he picks up the ball, uh, dribbles, continues the run, lets off lets off an excellent shot. Uh, it's probably best he didn't score. It would have been good for the game. It would have been an absolutely wonderful moment. It mightn't have been good for his player development. We we've seen what too fate big for his or, britches. <laughs> yeah, fate or or these kids uh egos or you know just just the way things go not to mention that that shooting is probably the wrong option there just fyi there were like three guys open (laughs) yeah yeah true but it was a great shot um so he's been great i I mean it's interesting that he's a right-footed player um in the previous game against west ham he ended up being pretty much our best attacking option um and this is it's funny that it's at the senior level uh, in the Premier League where you're really starting to see, rather than like the, the Europa League games, where he's become an attacking option. And, and that cutting back in and putting in a cross with his right boot, you know, maybe that's a one-off game or a two-off game, but he's he's really learned to... Maybe maybe the defense stepped off him a little bit too much and, and gave him that option, but he's really kind of... Uh, become much more than just a great athlete keeping keeping his nose clean and, and keeping it tidy on the left side. The last two games, he's really looked like an option. Um, and uh, it, it'll be great for him. It'll be really interesting to see how he turns out. His decision-making was always the thing I was a bit concerned about, his mentality, his body language. Um, and while he's not the youngest of them, he's still... You know, he still has no experience at a at an upper level, and the manager seems to continue to talk him up. So, so maybe we're going to see a lot more from him. Yeah, the Kalasinac situation is very, very interesting, but but maybe it's very simple too. Maybe the manager said he's jaded. It's coming up to the Christmas period. I'll give Maitland Niles a couple of games, as you guys talked about. Yeah, and to be fair, I mean, if you think that you can't, you know, that there's a player that needs to get some time on the on the bench and isn't going to be able to play every match. I think he picked games where he at least felt he could reasonably blood Maitland Niles and not put him under immense pressure. I mean, obviously, I don't think he's been exceptional in the Europa League. I think he's done okay. Uh, I agree I, with that. Yeah. I actually think he's been better in the Premier League and maybe some of yeah. that is playing fullback suits him better than wingback, which is not really intuitive, but maybe that's really the case. Um okay. And probably always uh, often he- helped by what we've talked about many times, which is, you know, playing with a better team. Yeah, that's uh, a really good point. With a better yeah. structure. Yeah, when you're playing with, you know, nine guys who are kind of familiar with each other and you're only integrating a couple, it's a lot easier than, you know, a fully rotated 11 with second tier quality. I mean, I imagine yeah. playing with Mesut Ozil in midfield is easier than, no offense, playing with Francis Coughlin. I mean, if offense yeah, intended, and, and but and no offense ways, intended to you, Paul, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but in some ways, less of a knock-on quality, though, but more about that the rest of the structures in place. Cohesion, yeah. To your point. Yeah, they all yeah. already know how to play with each other. You just got to plug in, and I think that's difficult for every Europa League, League player. Like, I mean, Giroud has pretty much struggled in quite a few games. Theo, uh, until recently, has struggled too, because every player has the same issue. They might all be good players, but nobody's kind of playing in a structure or well, that second that's team, ideal for them. We've talked about yeah. it. They all seem a little square peg and round hole yeah. kind of with, with that formation, especially Tim. You know, with the Maitland-Niles thing, I mean, he has a dribble on him. I think he completed four dribbles in the match. Um, his recovery <clears throat> runs are exceptional. I think, you know, the one thing we know about Arsenal is <laughs> you better have some fast fullbacks because they're going to they're mm. be racing back. Uh, to to close the back door, you know when it's I'd left. love to see him and Hector race. Yeah, yeah, that'd be a hell of a race. And and I mean, we did see Hector turn on the Jets in this game to to recover one situation. I can't remember what it was specifically, but I mean, I guess my question for you, Tim, is if he's going to continue with the back four, and maybe you can address whether you think he will or not in this answer. But Ooh. if he is, and <clears throat> if he's going to have all of these, you know, linking passing midfield type players in, it will be Wilshire, Ozil. Shaka starts to feel a little redundant. And while I still think he's an exceptional passer of the ball, does the kind of more explosive, pacey, dribbly, defensive quality of uh, Maitland-Niles suddenly make a lot more sense, whereas Shaka might just be a little redundant 
in the formation as it's currently being uh, deployed? Yeah, possibly. He's um, he's certainly building his case. Um, I think. I, I think he's been very interesting at fullback. And when you listen to what Arsene Wenger said about him as a fullback, a lot of what he referenced, um, he referenced, you know, his recovery speed, and you know, he's good in the one-on-one. Um, a lot of it made me think. Yeah, those those are those are good uh, qualities for a defensive midfielder to have. And it, it feels to me like, I don't know, maybe I'm projecting a bit too much, but it really does feel to me like Arsene's kind of saying, right, I think these are what your qualities are. And if I put you in your position, these are the qualities I really want to see from you. I know you can pass the ball. Um, I've known that since you were 17 years old. You can pass the ball really well. You played in midfield against Southampton, albeit all right, Southampton's you know second string last year. And you showed me you could pass the ball from the base of midfield. So I already know that. Um, and I know that Granit Xhaka can do that. But when he but when he spoke about uh, Maitland-Niles after the game, you know, he talks about his recovery, his one-on-one defending. And, and you know, I just, I just wonder. I just wonder if he's thinking, right, those are the two things that really that, that interest me about you that I think you could bring to this role. And uh, what, what are, like, two things that Granit Xhaka definitely does not have um, recovery pace and he's not very good one-on-one defending. So again, this, this could be me entirely projecting. No, uh, that, I, I don't think that, so. <laughs> I don't think that's so. just, that just made me think, I wonder if you thought, right, I've got two games coming up where I know we're going to play two teams who are not going to attack us at all. Um, and they're not going to attack us from wide. If they attack us, it's going to be through the center. And, so I'm going to put you there fairly confident that you're not really going to get massively exposed, but you've got these two qualities that I think could be interesting. And I want to see, I want to see what they're like and, and fullback, you know, fullback is a good position to test them out. So it's like, I know you can, I'm, I'm happy you can pass the ball. You can pass the ball from fullback all day long as well. That's fine. I'm happy to have a fullback, particularly when I've got six left footers in the team. I think I can afford to have a right-footed left-back. You played there a bit in the Europa League. And, uh, yeah, I, d- I don't know, because otherwise, it's kind of difficult to make sense of it. Otherwise, like, why Maitland-Niles suddenly got thrown in at left-back in a back four? Well, especially um, he, could put Nacho, he could put Nacho there and bring in one of the... Yeah. I mean, it also begs the question, how little does he trust Rob Holding and Callum Chambers, obviously, um, yeah. and Per yeah. Mertesacker? I mean, not not even remotely, but... Um, I mean, well, so so then... Do do you do you think that he's now decided to go I mean look we've always wondered how much he how much he believed in a back 3 how much of it was just mm. something he kind of got forced into at a really bad run of form and how long he'd stick with it he's gone to a back 4 now in a couple of games he did it in the United game and I I know I suspect that the way we played in the back 4 in the way we tried to chase that game probably stuck with Arson do you think you know the back three is dead long of the back four <laughs> no i don't um okay. i well I, do, I, I don't necessarily i i you know i i think there's a lot of value in us going a bit horses for courses um but the proof in the pudding will be when mustafi is available again i i still tend to think what's happened is he doesn't think kashelne is entirely comfortable in that central um defensive position in the back three you know, Monreal's not quite comfortable there. The, the two players that can do it are Mustafi and Mertesacker. Mustafi's injured. And, you know, Mertesacker had that game at Southampton, which I think um, might be the last time we ever see him in the Premier League. Yep, agreed. Um, I, I think that game was very much... It, it takes a lot for Arsene to substitute any kind of centre-half, let alone a really experienced one. Um, and he did that quite quickly against Southampton. And, you know, his reluctance to play him last season shows you that he's had these doubts. And I think that might be Mertesacker finished unless there's um, an injury crisis. In terms of the Premier League, I'm sure he'll still get cut. Oh, he games. did switch it to a, a back four at the same time, which gave him a little bit of an excuse, didn't he? Well, he wasn't yeah, going to go yeah. defender for defender when we're chasing the game at that point, right? I mean, Yeah, yeah. But I, I just tend to think he really he's looking at it and thinking, well, I've really only got two guys. And he's tried El Nenny there. He's tried Monreal there. Koscielny's had a go there. And I think he thinks there's only two guys that can play in the center of a back three. It's Mustafi and Matasaka. 
and one of them I just don't trust anymore. So I think the real proof in the pudding will be Friday against Liverpool when the staff is back. Liverpool have got you know this obviously awesome attack. If he does away, if he s- sticks with the back four against Liverpool. I think the back three's gone forever, but I'm not convinced he will. And I kind of hope he doesn't stick with the back four for Liverpool because we just... Mm. The thing that scares me is their pace. We don't have to come on to Liverpool yet. We can talk about it after the West Ham Carabao Cup game, but like their pace and dribbly qualities in the channels, right? I mean, we're so vulnerable yeah, down exactly. the wings, especially in the back four. I mean, if Maitland-Niles or Hector Bellerin get caught up the pitch, no matter how quick they are, they're not catching Sané. They're not catching... Is Sané even around? They're not catching Salah. Um, so, I, you know, I just, you worry about that. And then you have like a Koscielny or Nacho Monreal one-on-one in the box with Mohamed Salah. Like, you know, he's a little I- yeah. Aryan Robin-y right now. You know, I mean, you just, you, yeah. he's unplayable. So, yeah, we'll, we'll come on to that. I mean, I, it is definitely, I think at some level, a huge criticism of the development of Chambers and Holding that he just does not feel he can put them into that formation and, and have mm. any confidence in them. Um, and who knows, maybe part of it is just he knew he was going to be facing three consecutive teams. I mean, well, he didn't start that way in Southampton, but certainly Newcastle at home and West Ham away that would park the bus and sit deep, and he just opted to have one less defender and one, one more attacker. Not to mention that I think Ramsey's absence has forced his hand yeah. because Bingo. in a back three without Ramsey, you're really short on that, that extra goal scorer. You know, his secondary, his secondary runs are so important to how we create chances in the back three, which, you know, begs the question what he does, obviously, against Liverpool because we're still not going to have Ramsey. Um, Paul, I don't think we've done Mesut Ozil enough credit, so I think we need to come back to him for a minute. He scores a sensational goal. I think he had, what do you have, eight key passes? I got, I got to bring this up because it really is extraordinary. You know, he, he plays 107 passes, 126 touches. He had two, uh, what was it, two shots, two shots on target, eight key passes, three dribbles. I mean, I, I wrote on Twitter, I would never have guessed, you know, at the beginning of the season that I would be watching Mesut Ozil single-handedly dragging us to victories, but that's kind of what's happening right now. Um, you know, you, you touched on it already, but how impressed were you with him in this game and in this run with the way he's taken on not just his quality of play, but a leadership role on the pitch in terms of, of his performances? Yeah, he's been sensational. Um and there's always two sides to that. There's the the other side of well, we've had you for what five? This will be his fifth year, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you know the second year was really good, and the the third year he was going for the assists record, wasn't it? And then it was last year, and it's just so frustrating. I can't imagine the level of the frustration the manager had when he thinks. He could have had his second Berg camp because when he gets his head right, and for some reason, I'd hate to speculate, I'm sure there's plenty of speculation why, but for some reason, he's decided that uh, if nobody else is going to lead, he's going to lead. And he's, he's doing it both ends. He's working, it, you know, even in the games in which he could in the past have told himself, hey, you know, they're not playing it the way I like to play. This is stupid. They're not creating the situations I like to thrive in. It, every single game now, he's putting in a shift all over, showing leadership, being the man. Um, and it's it's wonderful. It's brilliant. And it's incredibly frustrating. It's so weird to hear hear you say that, Paul, because in a way, like, I mean, I feel like I'm the kind of person who would be like, let me you tell are. you what sucks about this great performance from Mesut yeah. <laughs> No, you but, are. But, Don't but, get me wrong. No, but here you are doing it. I mean, for me, yeah. I think it's just... Aren't we all? Well, I mean, the thing it's easy to forget is that these are 20-something-year-old players, you know? And I think of myself when I was 20-something, and I can't even say on the podcast that, you know, the kind of life choices I was making at that time. Um, <clears throat> but they mostly involved being out late drinking and trying to find, you know... Uh, people of interest to spend uh, late nights having deep conversations with. But, like, you know, I think he maybe, I mean, maybe something clicks. I mean, sometimes, you know, you you start to mature and, you know, he he wants to win and, and maybe the manager has convinced him that he needs to take more responsibility on his shoulders for that. I mean, he came from Real Madrid where he was a cog in a very big, very extravagant machine Maybe he's starting to realize that these players look up to him, that they need him to be more influential. I mean, I'm projecting here. I have absolutely no idea. Sure. But, I, you know, I think 
physically he may be starting to have developed. I mean, we, we changed our, you know, our, our training a little bit over the, the past few seasons, maybe the, the periodization we hear so much about. I mean, we've had Champions League and Champions League qualifiers. Maybe the fact that he's only playing once a week means he's just more fit for these games because he was a 60-minute guy at Real Madrid and he's a 90-minute guy for us. I think there are a lot of defenses you can make, but I think periodization and once a week and and maturing into this and, you know, look, let's not be totally uh, shiny, happy people about this, playing for a contract somewhere, if not at Arsenal, um, doesn't hurt yeah you know and, and or, a world and a world or just Cup the year. mentality of you know you can you can always take a negative or a positive view on it yeah he could be playing for a contract or he he just may realize that his future is in his hands uh and taking an ownership and a leadership position on his future yeah be it at arsenal yeah. or elsewhere very probably elsewhere well, as opposed to he's just doing it for the money i mean you i don't think you can fake it just for the money the guy has clearly stepped up his shoulders are broader um he's not getting down he's not getting pissed off uh he's he's pulling the team forward no matter what crappy team we're playing and no matter no matter how badly we're playing and you just say, to, and you hear the manager talk about him, especially about goals. And even after that goal, he's still making the point: this is the shit he should be trying to do all the time, but he doesn't want to do this. Well, Messed, if you really want to be one of the greats, you got to start spanking in goals. You got to start taking real shots. Stop passing it in all the time. Not that I should be giving him any fucking. Uh, advice or lectures, no, and, but it's he, clear he, to anybody watching him. He that goals are worth more than assists; they just are. Well, technically, an assist is worth one goal, but yeah, I get your point. Um, yeah, because <laughs> if you have an Spank assist, it in it. yes, and, and look, do we, what do, we, you have more skill than anybody on that field. Put it to putting the ball directly in the back of the net, because those bozos beside you aren't. Keeping up with their conversion rates. We'll uh, we'll, we'll come on to spankings a little bit later, but but yeah. Tim, I, you know if there's if there's a guy who's not dragging us to victory, but I don't know if it's through any fault of his own. It's it's Alexander Lacazette, and this is a really curious situation. Now, I thought he was really really good in the first half. I really do. Um, he he had some really nice plays. He played in Messet at one point, uh, who kind of got to the end line. Just the angle was a little too sharp. I think he he tried to slip it past the keeper, but. I don't. Yeah, I don't need to paint pictures for you, you guys. Saw the match, but uh, moral of the story is that you know he has become the seventy-minute man for us, and and not even once a week because a lot of times he's not getting the start. Um, the substitutions certainly feel prescribed. It's going to be Welbeck off the bench first. Giroud's going to come on. I mean, if you're Lacazette, what what needs to happen now? What do you think is going on? I know we've talked about him in previous podcasts, but what do you make? What did you make of this performance and where his first season at Arsenal is headed? Um, before I answer that, I'm going to add really quickly on Ozil. Please do. Um, two things. First of all, Paul, when you were speaking, the phrase that was just leaping up in my head that Arsenal always uses, technical leader. Mm. Um, he's becoming a technical leader rather than um, a virtuoso, um, which is great. Um, second of all, I wonder, and again, this is projection, I wonder how much he was hurt by the fact that Barcelona were throwing the kitchen sink at Felipe Coutinho and didn't want a bar of him. Um, you know, uh, maybe that's part of it, but that's yeah. all just speculation. Um, on Lacazette, honestly, I think what needs to happen is he just needs to play a bit better. Um, I think he's been very up and down. I think he's done a lot good. I think there's a, quite a bit that's still a bit indifferent and um, I think you can come to expect that really he's 26 he was at Leon his whole career so this is a big move for him it's something completely different I mean I think we possibly underestimate um, because there's so much kind of immigration and emigration in the Premier League I think we possibly underestimate just uh, how much a move even from somewhere as close as France um, how difficult that can actually be um, for a guy who's been in Leon all his life. Um, but I, I think he's been a bit streaky. I, I think he was quite up and down in this game. And honestly, um, every, every time he's been substituted, I know there's been a lot of comment about the physical side of it, but there's never really been a substitution where I've thought, oh my God, why is he bringing him off? Like most of the time I've kind That's of thought, fair. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. But I at can, some I can see point, why that is. don't you but, have to give yeah. your striker ninety minutes and like see? You, you, you know, I mean, look, and I get it. And you know, Newcastle were going to have to come out more. They were going to have to chase the game, which they did. You know, you think Lacazette yeah. can thrive in those situations? Look, it is hard for a player who bases his game on running and getting into the box to dominate teams that are going to put ten yeah. behind the ball. <clears throat> but he's routinely being taken out at times of the match. Now, look, I get it when it's nil-nil away to Southampton or you know one-one or whatever, yeah, and you yeah, need yeah. to start pumping balls into the box. That's not his game. Yeah. But when you do have a lead and it's getting late, doesn't he deserve the chance to show what he can do when the opposition has to come out yeah. a little bit? Yeah, I think so. Or, or at the very least, let's stop bringing Giroud on for him in that situation and perhaps go for Welbeck or something. Yeah. You know, maybe he's ju- he's just kind of playing the long game here physically, and maybe in February and March um, we'll see Lacazette, you know, in very very fine fettle, and maybe we'll look back on this period and think, yeah, that 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 was a good move to be giving him seventy minutes. It's not unusual. Um, he did it when he first brought Van Persie into the team when Van Persie was about 21. He kept taking him off after about 70 minutes and people kept saying, why, why? And, uh, and, and all Wenger would ever say is 70 minutes is enough for him at the moment. Um, so it, it's, it's a kind of tool he's used fairly regularly um, down the years. But at the same time, I do think I still think the biggest possible upside for Arsenal this season is to get Alexis Ozil and Lacazette playing together and really get that partnership going um, and really, really get that chemistry going uh, for the second half of the season. I I just think that, more than anything, is going to win us points. It's going to get us goals. Um, You know, I, I, I suppose a little bit like Liverpool were trying to do in terms of you know, the rest of their team's a, a bit of a tyre fire, but they've got four attacking players who can really, really turn it on and they can play together in pretty much any combination, um, actually. And, and and I just think that's, that's potentially the biggest upside for our season. But I think a lot of the criticism about Wenger taking Lacazette off, um, sorry to keep repeating this, but I think it's because a lot of people have taken against Sanchez. Mm-hmm. And when you take against one of the attackers, um, you know, you've got kind of, you know, dousing one guy's candle, you know, means you've got to like try and make the other one burn a little bit brighter. Um, and so I kind of think that like, because people have taken against Sanchez, Lacazette is like the horse everyone has to back. And again, you can understand that because he's got a much you know, more viable long-term future at Arsenal than Alexis and probably Ozil as well. But I, I feel like there's a bit of that going on as well. Yeah. People want to see Lacazette stay on because they want to see Sanchez come off and they want to see Sanchez as as the full guy. That's fair. I mean, to be fair, you know, the funny thing is Sanchez is a great example though, right? I mean, if we took Sanchez off at 70 minutes every game this season, how many fewer points would we have? Because it's in the last yep. 20 minutes that Sanchez has won us games and you know, I admit that Lacazette looks like he starts to fade and tire. So I'll be the first to admit that he he does not have the energy in the engine that Alexis does. But we have no idea what he could be doing for us in that stage of a game. When it, when games tend to get a little more fractured, a little more broken, sometimes more open. When defenders, as they tire, they tire mentally, and maybe they don't track his run off the last shoulder. You know, the shoulder of the last defender. I just it's. With, he, so with this, yeah, it's, it's a it's a little bit like Maitland Niles at left back where you kind of think, oh, what's that about? And you kind of have to really kind of stretch and use your imagination to come up with reasons. It's, it's one of those things. I would love it if someone would just ask Arsene Wenger the question, and I'd love it if... Um, I, I kind of understand why he doesn't, but I'd love it if he answered it like without being defensive, because I'm sure there's a really good reason for it that we're just not aware of. I mean, um, it's Occam's razor, I'm, right? Like, sometimes the most yeah. obvious answer is the correct one, and maybe it is just as simple as he doesn't feel physically he's up to 90 minutes in the Premier League yet. And exactly. He, he's and, easing and him like in. I say, and, yeah, and like I say, maybe he, you know, I think and on some occasions you've just got to say, well, the manager knows more than we do in terms of the data and the information he has available to him. Um, and there has to be a good reason for this, because it, it looks like, you know, a, a kind of a point, of principle almost at this state it looks like a kind of i'm definitely going to bring him off after 70 minutes um unless unless something drastic happens so 
you've got to think that there's a reason behind it that we just don't know. Paul, I, I'm gonna. I'm a big believer in on, in football clubs in the in the concept of addition by subtraction. That sometimes a pet player being at a club can be problematic, or having the option of using a player, or trying to keep a player happy, can actually affect the the whole negatively. A great example of that would be Alex Oxley Chamberlain getting left wing back starts at the beginning of this season. I am of the opinion that selling Giroud. I know this is going to come as a huge shock to everybody. Selling Giroud would be addition by subtraction right now. That. The manager needs that option taken away from him, that he is so concerned with keeping Giroud happy, getting Giroud minutes, that this pre-planned Giroud for Lacazette sub, part of it has nothing to do with Lacazette. It's that he wants Giroud happy. He wants Giroud to be in the France World Cup team. Let's remember these are all Frenchmen going into a World Cup year, that he knows if he can get him 20 minutes every game in the Premier League plus the midweek games, that there's a future for Olivier Giroud and, and that he's protecting the player. We are... Uh, let's just pretend for a minute we don't sell Alexis and we don't sell Ozil and that there's 20 or 25 million on the table for Giroud in January. I, would you sell Giroud and do you think the manager would be would be helped by not having the Giroud option at his disposal? I hear where you're coming from. I'll go with do I think he'll sell him? I don't think any of us do. The reason I the main reason I think he won't want to sell him uh is cuz you often hear the manager's talk about where the goals are going to come from specifically which players and in terms of goal scorers in his squad he doesn't have a lot of them he has Lacazette he has Sanchez Uh, Walcott hasn't been a factor maybe he will down the stretch if we switch formations but even that's kind of a part-time gig so uh, you know, he often talks about Ramsey being one of those goal scorers, but that hasn't really materialized over the last period of time. He gets his an odd goal and an odd, uh, an odd assist. Admittedly, they add up over the course of a season, but certainly you're not going to be banking on him getting a, putting the ball in the back of the net every second game. And I think he needs the security blanket of a for all his other faults, a proven goal scorer getting goals from situations that other people almost definitely wouldn't have. Um, And we could go down the list of other players, but I think we all know the issues that, you know, let's take Welbeck. A, he, he, to me, he's not where I would expect him to be in terms of form. And B, he's yet to prove he can be a consistent goal scorer, though it's funny how his numbers start to add up over time. It's a really good point, actually. I I mean, because if you you consider... Look, I'm a big fan of Welbeck, and I think he will come back into form, but form doesn't mean reliable goal scoring. And, you know, without a Giroud, you're really looking at two players I trust to get goals in the squad, period. (laughs) Yeah, I just... I don't see him... If he's not selling Alexis and he's not selling Ozil... Very much for the same reason he's not going to sell Giro. This is this is a big season for Wenger uh, himself, and I I just think he's played it ultra safe, and he's going to keep playing it. I I see no wiggle room in his statements on Giro. I can see why Giro would seriously look at it, and I yeah. do think it's why La- part of the reason why Lacazette gets subbed every sixty or seventy minutes because Giro's in most games is going to get twenty or thirty minutes. Um, because yeah. addition by subtraction, he's he's trying to keep Giro happy for his own purposes and for the sake of the squad going into the second half of the season that people's heads are screwed on right. Um, but I agree, it, it, it doesn't always feel from a f- football standing um, that the, that part of the game. When Giro came on, we had a really good five minutes, and I'm like, ha-ha, all you guys saying Wenger doesn't know how to do subs, ha take that. And then like you after about shit, four, yeah. <laughs> yeah, after about four or five minutes, we were we totally gave up and I was like, Oh, I'm well, glad I did tweet that. I, I am of the belief again, I've always thought this. The problem with Giroud, when you put Giroud in, these these teams that worry about us getting in behind suddenly don't have as much worry. The, the back four, the, or back five, whatever, their defense can play five yards further up the pitch, which means their midfield can play five yards further up the pitch. They don't have to be camped in their own box as much, which if they need a platform to attack, they can have because they have that one less worry. I mean, if Lack is... Indubitably, and then, then you look at the players around them. Admittedly, we brought on Welbeck, so, so, but... You know, we had Alexis, we had a Wobie, we had Jack, 
instead of Ramsey. So that there weren't those players to go in behind once yeah. you took Lacazette off. Yeah. Uh, it was basically Welbeck. And, uh, and that's uh, it. Some, yeah. And somehow that didn't seem to be a factor in this game. Well, yeah, and I look. I mean, Tim, just real quick on that. I, I, I think you and I tend to be aligned on on the position about how the manager treats Giroud and and whether that's in the best interest of the club. But do you want to have a quick uh, swing at that one? I mean, do you think it yeah. would be addition by subtraction to, to have him move on? I, I'm, I'm kind of convinced by Paul's point that we we just don't have enough goal scorers. Um, without him what if we um, buy Messi in in january would you sell him then <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'd i'd certainly consider it um yeah so because because i'm kind of a little bit on both sides about it because i like i think Giroud would be a really really useful player to have if the manager could be trusted to use him properly um you know like the way he used him against southampton fine um you know but he doesn't really use him properly and that, and that's that's what make like basically the manager makes it a bit of a problem um maybe if it was 30 million or more i might be <laughs> tempted with what we could do with that this is like on a game show proviso, now <laughs> yeah <laughs> on the proviso that we spend it in january um i i appreciate you're right we need we need to generate some revenue because we're losing all of these players um, if you told me we're going to sell Giroud and use that money to not necessarily replace Giroud, but to go for whoever the Ozil and or Alexis replacements are going to be, we say we'll buy one of those in January and we'll use the money we get from Olivier Giroud to do that. I might be more convinced by that. Um, but yeah, at, at the moment, I'd, I'd still probably be looking at Walcott um, to be honest, as as the potential, do you think the um, market for Walcott would be as revenue generating? I mean, frankly, look, if we're selling yeah, one of these guys to not. recoup revenue for the players, we're not recouping revenue for. I mean, Giroud could go down the table and still be worth thirty million to a club like oh, I don't know, yeah. Everton. Um, well, look, let's come on to the fun stuff then. Would you sell Alexis? San- I- I'm going to give you the, the scenario: mm. forty million on the table from Manchester City, mm. no using it to buy in January. Would you sell Alexis this January? No. No. On, only if there's a replacement. Now, a lot of people are going to scream at the podcast, you're crazy. So, so defend it. Because <laughs> I agree with you, and, and I have a defense for mm. it, but I want to hear yours because the, most of the engagement, I love that word, engagement, I've had online suggests that people think bite their hand off for that $40 million. Yeah. I, yeah, not, not if we're not using it in January, no, because why... Why would you lose one of your best players in January and not replace him? Um, this is exactly the sort of shit we've been <laughs> we've been moaning about for ages about Arsenal. Um, no, I, I think like you, I think um, while I don't think he's in very good form at all, um, I think it's massively overstated how bad um, his form is. And like I said, I, I just see for me. I see Alexis, Ozil and Lacazette as key to getting back in the top four. And Ozil started to fire now. He's got, you know, he, he got that injury in pre-season and took him a little while to get going. But he's he's motoring now. Um, there's, you know, there's every reason to believe that Lacazette is going to hit that upside before the end of this season. That he's going to improve. He's going to get more consistent. He's going to be able to play 90 minutes more often. Alexis... Alexis can play himself back into form. We know he can. We've seen it before. Um, and and I, ju- I just think that that's our best route back into the top four. And the yes. top four is our best way of replacing them. I suppose my only concern is, I was thinking earlier when we were talking about Ozil, um, and maybe this is um, a bigger question and therefore another podcast, but isn't it weird how Ozil and Alexis never hit top form at the same time? There, yeah. there almost you know seems what? to be this yin yang. Have you ever seen them in the same room together? Maybe they're the same person. <laughs> Wait, no, so every, that can't be. <laughs> every every time Alexis hits top form, Ozil suffers. Uh, well, you know, maybe correlation isn't causation and all of that, but it just seems to me that it's almost like they're wrestling over the keys for the team. It's almost like there's this Arsenal strengthometer going on. Well, I, you know what, and, Tim? Or I, an arm wrestle. <laughs> I, I think there's something to that, but I think it's it's particularly true 
in in periods where Alexis is dropping deeper because they mm. both want to play the killer final ball, but what Ozil really needs from Alexis is for him to be getting on the ends of moves. And, yeah. and when Ozil is dropping deeper, then Alexis has to... Uh, when Alexis is dropping deeper, then Ozil has to make the runs, and he has to get more yeah. advanced. And we are a better it, it, team it, when it's Ozil deeper and Alexis more advanced than the other way around. Isn't it yeah. ironic that the one time I can remember the two of them playing great was when... Remember that period where Ozil was on the shoulder of the defender... And yep. he was the guy making the runs, and it was Alexis who kept finding him. It was yep. it was only a period of a few games, but it looked like, oh, wow, they've almost reversed roles. Yeah, it's just, you yeah, know what, Paul? Yes. I, I still think Alexis is one of the best penalty box players in the league, if not the world. I think he sure. is incredible in the penalty box, and we just have to find ways to get him in there. And I still think you are getting the best of what Ozil can do when he's playing into an Alexis in the box as opposed to vice versa. Um, we are I just, re- really I just quickly running out of time here. from, yeah, from Udinese, can't remember his name, saying... Di Natale? Alexis Sanchez? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Di Natale, saying that uh, Alexis was a hell of a number 10. And anytime I've seen him really play the number 10 role, he's really good. He because is, but we have another one. have no <laughs> fecking clue what he's going to do where he can, you know, he can beat two or three players just in front of the penalty box and open those gaps up. He's a hell of a number 10. I love him as number nine. Um, yeah. we're, we're really, really, really quickly running out of time. So I just want to get to, to one or two more things really, really quickly here. Just if you could just give me your answer in sort of one sentence form, would you sell him if we couldn't replace in January? No. Okay. Um, I, uh, I think, uh, I think, the options look very unpalatable without him, and with him, yeah, his, fu- his form's kind of funky, but we've got to make it work. Yeah, look, intellectually, I can understand. The argument is sell him, get the $40 because we need the cash to start the rebuild. We can't afford to lose him for free. My argument is I'd roll the dice on finishing top four, which gets you $40 million for the Champions League plus Champions League to attract other better players, plus he could help you win the Europa League, which would be great for all the reasons that would be great, not to mention the fact that this is a football season I would still like to enjoy, so that should factor into it at some level. Um, so all of the all of those things, I think, matter. Uh, not that I would care about him going to Manchester City, who, as Tim said, t- quite tongue-in-cheek on Twitter, uh, are not our rivals at the moment. Um, real quick, oh, and I should mention, I do have a wager on the internets. Um, over Alexis, if he stays at the club, I have wagered that he will score uh, 10 or more goals in the league the rest of the season. So we'll see how that plays out. Uh, final thoughts real quick, Tim. Uh, the, the correct answer is 11 changes, but uh, what kind of team would you send out for the Carabao Cup? Yeah, it's good. I, I, it would definitely be 11 changes and maybe maybe even a completely different 18. Maybe yeah, even 12. 18 changes? <laughs> It's yeah, yeah. I, I I see this being everyone who hasn't played. The only player I can see staying in is Maitland Niles because I don't think he'll play left back against Liverpool. So um, yeah, I, I see it being wholesale changes, and you know that uh, that's still going to be quite an experienced team because that's going to be Welbeck, Walcott, Giroud, Coquelin, or Nenny. Um, it's not going to be a team of kids. No, but, the manager alluded um, to that. He said it'll yeah. be experienced internationals. So I mean, you know, yeah. I, I think that that is how it will play out. Paul, do you uh, do you feel the same, or do you want to go all out for the Carabao Cup? Uh, no, I feel the same. I mean, it is weird that we're, you know, the debate is whether we rest Ainsley Maitland Niles for the, the the League Cup so he can be available for the Premier. You know, did we picture that one a few, a few weeks you ago? You did, and, buddy. You did. Uh, <laughs> not sure I did. Willock might get a start. I was just looking at. Jorge Bird's possible team. That's how I like to think he pronounces it. I think it. Willick is um, probably worth a start. And look, yeah, so that'll be interesting. The, 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 rotation, the rotated 11 can't do any worse against West Ham, at least in the attacking half, than the first 11 did. So there's that. Um, look, yeah. we, w- we will have a podcast after that game and probably talk very little about that game and talk about the impending Liverpool fixture. Uh, maybe get into a, a little bit of, of some of the other pet topics and invite Scott back on for some statistical analysis. Did not have time for that today. Sorry for wrapping it up so quickly, but uh, I am rapidly approaching being late for the thing that pays me to be able to have uh, the uh, computer on which I record this podcast. In any event, uh, Tim is on Twitter at Stilberto. Thanks, Tim. My pleasure. Yeah, uh, uh, Paul's on Twitter at Pause No My Pants. Thanks, Paz. 
Woo-hoo. My name's Elliot Smith. You can block me on Twitter, Yankee Gunner. Give us five-star reviews and write uh, nasty things about Clive, although I have a suspicion no one will be able to think of anything. But come on, be creative. You can find something. Make fun of that voice. Ugh, that voice. I'm so jealous. Anyway, uh, yeah, we'll talk to you after uh, Arsenal 10, West Ham nil. No.